nature is incredibly complex. Aren't we hypnotized by the beauty and the sophistication of the Nautilus shell? We stare in awe at the majesty of the peacock. Above all, the complexity of nature reveals itself to us any time we think of the human body and cognition. It's absolutely tantalizing how from two single cells a fully-fledged organism arises. The molecular and cellular processes are so intricate. The level of organization, communication and cooperation among them is simply exquisite. We often speak of the miracle of life to describe how mesmerizing this complexity appears to us, a miracle indeed. If we don't want to resort to religious concept, we speak of magic, as if there were no rational way of defining nature in its intricacy. However, we also realize how fragile it all is. A single point mutation in a single gene can cause severe diseases. While diseases are most often not triggered by us, they simply occur. We, ourselves, repeatedly damage what would otherwise be intact and strong. Regardless of whether triggered by us or simply arising, the question is, how can we repair these defects, be it water contamination or diabetes? In the context of medicine, for centuries, the answer has been drugs chemicals synthesized in the lab that would, for instance, block the interaction between two molecules such as proteins. Also, when thinking of repairing damages to ecosystems, we would typically adopt mechanical or chemical agents to, for instance, absorb spilled oil back. Well, while these approaches work to some degree and pay off, we realized recently that we would need something more sophisticated, intelligent systems, able to monitor the situation, detect when something goes wrong, react in time to bring things back to normal, finally returning to silent mode, waiting for the next emergency. Well, this is actually how nature itself works. Cells evolved defense mechanism that intervene whenever problems are encountered. A perfect example of this comes from the process of cell division. Cells divide following a cyclical series of events, and that's why we speak of the cell cycle. So-called checkpoints make sure that certain steps have been fulfilled. For instance, the mass doubled, the genetic material faithfully duplicated. If any of the milestones of a healthy cell cycle isn't reached, the checkpoints stop the process. The cells first tries to fulfill the requirement or repair the damage. If it's not possible, it will commit suicide to avoid further damage to the tissue. You may know that cancer arises when, among other processes being dysregulated, the cell cycle doesn't run properly, and the cells divide recklessly, accumulating lots of genetic errors. Good news. The knowledge in molecular biology and the technologies that stem from it have gone so far that nowadays it's possible to start creating these sophisticated systems that can help us repair nature following its very principles. Because these components, these systems, are themselves made of cells, proteins, and DNA, I speak of repairing nature with nature. Interesting, but how does it work? You're probably asking yourself now, what exactly do you have to do? Well, what we need to do is to manipulate these components to make them do what we want them to do. We need to practically give them the function that we require for our purposes. The branch of molecular biology that does this, engineering 
molecular and cellular devices that perform reliably and robustly function that we decided upon is called synthetic biology. The name sounds strange, doesn't it? The adjective synthetic makes us think of something unnatural and it seems to contradict the noun biology. However, synthetic is also the adjective of the verb to synthesize, which means to create out of parts. I am a synthetic biologist. I actually graduated in computer engineering in Rome, proud young woman among a mass majority of men. Just by pure chance, I decided to take on the challenge to do modeling of gene network for my master thesis. And I got so fascinated by molecular biology that I decided to pursue a PhD and, and left Italy for Germany. After obtaining my doctoral degree, I stayed in academia, and today I lead a team of very young, enthusiastic researchers. When I stopped to think about it, I realized that synthetic biology is the perfect match for me, because it represents the marriage between engineering and biology. I am firmly convinced that synthetic biology can help us and can offer solutions to many of the problems of our modern society. Let me give you a concrete example. Every year, up to 200,000 tons of chemical colorants are lost to effluents and pollute the water. We might not realize it, but the fashion industry has quite a neg negative impact on the environment. A more ecologically friendly way of coloring fabric is to use natural pigments produced, for instance, by bacteria, and therefore not requiring any of the toxic substances that are used in the chemical synthesis of colorants. Often for us, it's more convenient to use a special type of bacterium that is growing quickly and well in the lab, has been well characterized and can be genetically manipulated, rather than any of the species that naturally produce the pigment. However, in this case, we need to bring in this bacterium of choice the genetic information to produce the pigment. That's what we did. We took the gene that encodes the protein that makes the pigment and we put it into a non-pathogenic bacterium. When we wanted the bacteria to produce the pigment, we added an inducer to the culture medium. The bacterial cells picked it up and this told them to make the protein, which in turn produced the pigment. You nicely see how the culture turned blue. So we did not test this pigment on, fragment, on, on fabric, but other researchers did. It is likely that this way of coloring fabric will take over. Uh, we will have to adapt to have less bright colors in our wardrobe, but I'm sure we all agree it's worth it. I told you, when we wanted the bacteria to produce the pigment, we put an inducer into the culture medium. Indeed, just like we do with our electronic devices, we wish to turn our biological devices on and off at our convenience. So we need ways to tell to the proteins or the cells it's time for action. There are many ways of doing this. In the example I gave you before, the inducer was a sugar. However, there is another trigger that I am particularly fond of, light. Light has many advantages over small molecules. It can be quickly applied and removed. It's relatively cheap and it can be patterned. These are features that are very important because sometimes we want to locally activate our biological device or we want to turn it on and off repeatedly. And for this, we need a trigger that does not lead any trace in the cell. The technology that combines the use of light and genetically encoded components is called optogenetics. It may sound science fiction to you, but researchers have brought this technology so far that they can let specific neurons fire in the brain of a living mouse to study their role in many biological processes and behaviors such as feeding. 
In this short movie I will show to you now, you see a mouse freely running in a cage with some food. What you see on the head of the, on the, head of the mouse is an optical fiber needed to deliver the light to the brain. During the blue light illumination phase, the mouse actively searches for the food and eats. And this is because the neurons that are involved in the eating process, in the feeding behavior, are being activated. In the dark phase, the mouse is actually avoiding, or at least is not eating, proving the fact that these neurons have a role in the feeding behavior. In my lab, we also work with optogenetics. We engineer novel and natural proteins whose function is under right regulation. These proteins are normally blind to light. So it's up to us to find ways to plug light sensitivity in them. Fortunately for us, nature is full of proteins that respond to light because light is a source of energy for a lot of organisms and controls many cellular processes. So how do we do this? How do we engineer novel, unnatural proteins whose function is under light regulation? We take from nature one protein or even just one part of it that responds to light. And we take another protein, or also in this case, just the part that bears the function we're interested in, and we fuse them together, we make a chimera. The beautiful part comes now. If we do this right, we are able to control the activity of this chimera by shining and removing light from it, because the light-sensitive part has two shapes, one in the dark, one in the light. Let me demonstrate this to you with my body. Assume I am the light-sensitive protein. In the dark, my arms are tightly bound to my chest. In the light, my arms are detaching themselves from the chest and they are extending towards the side. Let's assume this presenter is the functional part with this surface needed for the function to occur. When it's fused to me and I am in my dark shape, this surface is not available. The function cannot take place. But when I am in my light shape, this function can occur because the surface is nicely available to do its job. Of course, it's not that easy to do what I just told you, to take two proteins that have nothing to do with each other, fuse them together in, in a way that the function that we like is under light regulation. But sometimes we are successful. I told you that proteins perform functions, and therefore synthetic biologists aim to control proteins in many different ways. One way is to control their localization in the cell. Cells are extremely dynamic places, and proteins move around continuously, because depending on where they are in the cell, they perform different functions Controlling protein localization equals to controlling protein function. Some years ago, in my lab, we developed a system that can allow us to move proteins around in the cells. Here you see cells imaged under the fluorescent microscope. The color that you see is a special protein that glows and can be detected. You will see that only in the cell that has been illuminated, highlighted by the green circle, the signal is redistributing in the cell when we apply and remove light, while in the other cells that are kept in the dark, this is not happening. This is the power of light. We can apply it with a very high spatial resolution. Another way of controlling proteins is to dictate when they are made. So in my lab, we recently developed a light-inducible protein that can read the information in genes to make other proteins. Because I told you that light can be patterned, we can now specify down to the single cell resolution where the protein is going to be made. So let's now imagine that we have a plate full of bacteria. So practically, the bacteria form alone on the plate and we shine light through a photomask. 
That is, we don't shine light everywhere on every cell, but only to some cells according to a predefined pattern, we can obtain with the bacteria a photograph or a painting. This is a bacteriograph. It's the reproduction of a famous painting by Michelangelo produced with bacteria. It's quite impressive, isn't it? It's just that, unfortunately, being made of bacteria is not as durable as the original one. Beyond artistic applications, optogenetics really holds promise for curing diseases in a less invasive manner. Here is an example. Mice that suffer from ulcerative colitis are given special microcapsules that contain non-pathogenic bacteria that have been genetically modified to respond to light by producing an anti-inflammatory protein. When the treatment is needed, light is externally and locally applied at the height of the intestine, where it tells the bacteria in the microcapsules to produce the therapeutic drug. Along similar lines, my lab is currently developing a novel, less invasive, targeted cancer therapy that also uses nanoparticles as delivery vehicles, and we also want to use proteins instead of drugs as the treatment. And we want to use light to start the treatment and confine it in space. Of course, it would be fantastic if we could use this technique already on human patients. However, there are many obstacles they need to overcome because, well, first of all, we need to approve the use of genetically modified bacteria in human beings, and we also need to develop the best strategies to deliver the light, because, all in all, a human body <laughs> is way thicker than a mouse, and visible light does not penetrate very deeply. Sadly, we reach the end of this very short journey in the amazing world of synthetic biology. I'm pretty sure that by now you know I am really passionate about it. I hope I was able to pass even just a small part of this passion to you. My take-home message to you is, don't be afraid of synthetic biology. It's the future. Thank you. <laughs>